Sorry, I forgot to start it. Sorry, Larry. That's I just a, wanted to start it. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, so I, I'm thinking it would make sense for us to just start that transition and and then let the budget committee pick up um, as they see fit in terms of how they want to structure their oversight of capital planning. Larry, when you say that um, capital planning is kind of in limbo, what do, what do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, while we're having these discussions right now, um, right. They, they, they haven't been meeting recently. And then my understanding is that they have no meeting planned at the moment. So that's, that's kind of where, where they're, where they're at. Um, there was some discussion in capital planning over the last couple of months about what their role really is. And, um, and there was some, some tension, I guess you could say, over sort of what, you know, the capital planning um, committee really does. And, um, and there were certain members of the capital planning committee who were thinking that, you know, part of their mission was to, you know, have an active role in the construction of the capital plan. Um, but really their role is more of an advisory committee, like, like the budget committee is an advisory committee, you know, to be the public's voice of oversight into how we do capital planning, which is a much sort of narrower scope. Um, and so that, and I think that met with some disappointment, um, that, that, you know, that reality among certain members of the capital planning committee. And so right now they're, they're, they're not planning to, to meet um, at a specific date. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It, it raises a little bit of a, of a, I don't know, flag might be too strong a word, um, in, in that capital planning is a critical and inherent part of the budgeting process. We're going into the budgeting cycle, right? So um, I, I wouldn't want to see it given short shrift just because the committee is about its advisory role versus how much their recommendations are really heated, which leads me to believe that maybe the suggestion that you look into expanding the budget committee to say, I'm just throwing a number out there, seven, and, and uh, I'm presuming that would have to be acted on at town meeting though. So it wouldn't take effect until the following year, correct? I'm not... That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I would be, I would be really, um, I would be an advocate for that expansion of the budget committee to give them a little bit more give them more hands on deck and then delegate through the budget committee to a subcommittee, the specific task of managing capital planning and, and making recommendations for capital planning. I don't really see why, and I don't know the history of it, but I don't really see why this entity is sort of out there doing something that's integral to budgeting in the first place. That makes sense. Jerry has his hand up. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, and if I may, I just um, don't want to disagree with Larry, but I have a little different perspective on one thing he said about the Capital Planning Committee not planning to meet. And historically, they don't meet unless there's leadership coming from administration saying it's time for a meeting and getting together the materials to discuss. It's been strongly dependent on when Mel was there, who was the town manager, and then that was not a tradition that was continued. Um, for some reason, it's been more the town manager than the financial director. 
but um, so I just want to make it clear that for the t for the time I've been around, I don't think you can blame the capital planning committee for not meeting. That hasn't been what they do. They are there when requested is more the way I've seen it. So Tom, to pick up on uh, on your thought there, does it make sense for us to look to transition this at town meeting? It would give time for the budget committee expansion discussion to take place and the role of the capital budget with the budget committee. And then in March, we reappoint that committee anyway. We just wouldn't reappoint that committee. So if we act on this at town meeting, uh, and it, presumably the, the, the voters uh, agree to the expansion of the budget committee, which they established as an elected body. Um, can we do all that and have it take effect immediately? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I'm suggesting then. Now there might be a couple of members of the of the capital planning, current capital planning committee that well, there's only going to be two slots open or whatever, maybe three with the departure of uh, Mr. Silloway. Um, there may be enough slots to go around and maybe some people are ready to move on. Anyway, I don't know. Jerry might have a better handle on it. I, I, I don't, while I, while I, respect the long-standing commitment that people have made to the capital planning committee if we're going to transition sometime um, and they'll still have the opportunity to run for those slots to which they maybe heretofore were appointed so i would i would say yes i would advocate for trying to move this process through town meeting If we do that and have a good discussion at town meeting, then we know we're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The public will certainly tell us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they turn down expanding the budget committee. We know. And I just keep in mind one of the things we want to do with capital planning generally is move toward a model, multi year model. It reduces a lot of the variability mm -hmm. in there with everything from paving to equipment replaces replacement. So as we build that model out, this year being one step, building upon that, there's a lot less variability in there. You're just reacting to some of the factors that have come up in between, maybe a need to um, reprioritize or scale back if there's a change in cost, something has deteriorated more quickly, there's something wrong with a piece of equipment. You know, there's some sort of cycle change that comes up that forces that. There's still a sort of an, uh, an annual edit process now that we set it for five years and then come back at the end of it. Every year you're still editing, but you're talking about those around the edges, variable pieces, especially if we're making the transfers we need to make and we're lowering debt service, plugging that back into capital. All of these different things as they come together should keep that capital plan kind of on, it's mm -hmm. a very gentle C as opposed to what we've seen where there might be a, a big wave one year and then very little in the next wave the next year. Um, and so we are driving at a product that should be easier to fold in, should uh, mimic more what's happened with the budget, frankly, where there's you know a document that comes in that's pretty complete that has the components. And so that advisory function becomes easy, no, no less important, but still quite a bit easier to, to do. Mm -hmm. And in fairness, I think when Mel was there, they would take the list of projects and the capital committee would help figure out what the rank of those projects were. In this new model, it should rank them for you with predetermined weight. Yeah. Certainly on the paving and then when you get to trucks, it's scheduling out what's their useful life. We've got a list of them. How are we going to replace them and then get on that useful life cycle? 
and you can look years out that every you know, seven years you replace a dump truck. So that's programmed out. Let's use that example. And then pavement will look at condition index and that'll create the priority list. And where there might be some variability or some need for input is if you've got two similarly ranked projects that are at kind of the bottom of the priority list or there's some need to, we have X amount of funding, project need is Y and we've got a big funding fit need. So how does that, you know, which one makes it in one year versus, versus another mm -hmm. gets pushed maybe to the next year. Mm -hmm. A lot of that will be sorted out. Or there'll be options sorted out in the drafts before they ever arrive too, so that you'll know what those impacts look like. If you move this one, here's how it trickles out. If you move this one, here's how it plays out. But it'll be very much condition based. And set a target of pavement to good condition in the next number of years. And then each year, that's how we chop away at it. And it'll be a mix of bigger, smaller sections. You know, we'll have to figure out how it all fits because there's not enough money to do it all mm -hmm. right away. I think back in the day, they used to actually ride all around town. And they did that. Yeah. They evaluated the pavement conditions and whatnot. That was part of that group's task. Yeah. And, and, and so we'll go out this year and do it and, and follow the, there's an Army Corps of Engineers has a, has a model. You measure rutting and alligator cracking and all the other things. And we've got a software that they put together in collaboration with Colorado State. That's a, you know, used by a few different municipalities and others that you then put the scores in. It'll provide some of the cost data as well based on some larger aggregated cost sets. So then we'll have to make some refinements to that as we know what local pricing is, but it'll be a combination of that road piece with this sort of software piece to help us line them up in the order we want them to be in. And then similarly, we might do something, you know, build off that. It may not be this year with some of our staffing constraints, but a gravel road plan that takes, you know, we've set out, here's how much money, here's how long uh, of a stretch we think we can do with it, adding gravel, reshaping, doing some of the ditching. We can build off that to then say, here's what those projects look like for you know, five years out, however many years out. Um, and the equipment stuff's a little bit easier to set on a schedule. So as those all come together and we do it for sidewalks, should be, like I said, it should be a very calm sea where you're kind of bobbing up and down from year to year. You should get seasick <laughs> or at least terribly so. <laughs> so is there consensus to take this one to the town meeting? Would it be helpful if we answered some of the questions and kind of mapped out a lead in, lead out for you to consider at the next meeting? In other words, what would you need to make the change? How would it work at town meeting? What does it look like coming out if you go to the seven? Yeah, I do think that would be helpful. Okay. Well, plenty of time to get it warm, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, town meeting's not more until, I mean, their deadlines are end of January, so right. we're... All right. Well, thanks, Jerry. Next up is consider approving the ARPA funding committee scope of work. The building off some conversations that started in the summer now that we've got half of our nearly 1.4 million um, have put together scope, we went casting about to look at what other municipalities have put together for committee scopes of work um, and from all over the place. We tried to make one that made sense in our context. So that's on the memo. And then thinking again about committee size and membership and some of the other questions, there was a recommendation in August for a larger I think nine member committee. Um, what's in here contemplates something closer to seven, but there's certainly flexibility with that. But the scope of work lays out what the responsibilities and tasks would be and the deliverables and dates. So essentially from when you appoint, which at this point, if you did say the scope of work tonight, you appointed committee members at the December meeting that would give them from December 9th uh, until April 
14th is the meeting date that we picked in the scope of work um, to get through that task list above. We're starting to see quite a bit of the information coming in as towns reach out, VLCT starting to keep a, a listing or a database of um, what people are spending money on. So some of the questions are being refined. So it, it feels like a manageable task, at least from understanding what is or isn't eligible. The harder part might be trying to pull out um, some of the recommended pieces for use, depending on how far developed those things might be. So it might be a list that has some elements that, that still need to be fleshed out even, even farther as we move forward. But the basic responsibility tasks are to, to understand all of the criteria and guidelines, know what's eligible and what isn't. Um, We'll work with this committee to, to get some community feedback. We'll use um, old school and new school modes um, to the extent possible. I want to engage with other stakeholders. So if there are local groups that have um, uh, different perspectives on, on what some eligible uses could be and how those would translate to some community benefit, try to collect that. To develop a list of potential uses of those funds. Um, also identify where, hey, we think this is a good idea, but we don't know or magnitude for cost, we need some clarification on, you know, if, if we fully can, or, you know, do we need this, that, or the other? And then uh, we try to put some of these projects into uh, what are the recommended uses. The committee would have to follow the open meeting law, be a public body for that. So there's accessibility baked in, there's a minutes uh, component baked in. When I just set out as a final bullet, just some, guiding principles, I guess you call them, and I'm just trying to pull them from our conversation, as well as some of the other recommended ones, so that the funds are used equitably and provide broad, short, long-term impacts for the community. The recommendations are strategic and focus on making highest and best use of one-time funds. So I'm trying not to bake in anything programmatic or being fully aware that at some point I'll we'll have to figure out a different way to fund that. And then the community short long-term goals as represented, I just referenced the town plan as a common planning and vision document are served or otherwise advanced by the recommendations for use. Um, we're trying to make sure we're thoughtful that we're linking you into some of those ex exercises we've already done. Um, and then the report would be set up in a way that would try to answer some of those um, pieces there. How, the, how were the responsibilities and tasks met in addition to maybe describing process, including the feedback received so that you've got a complete listing from which we can and then start to make decisions about funding. We don't get the second half of the money until we're thinking somewhere in May, June of 2022. So by ending it in April, it does put you in position to start to deploy some of those resources moving forward from there. We have to have them obligated by the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. So we still have some time, especially if we're queued up in 2022, um, to get them out, especially if we wanted to roll them out um, for whatever reason, there's something that's a little more program based. We've been thinking more infrastructure, but if we need some extra time to set up, roll out those types of things, we do have a couple of years in between 22 and 26, say, to, to do that. Um, so there's a basic scope of work, and then there's the proposed seven member committee. I just went through pulling from some of the principles, is where obviously, as the legislative body, the select boards on there, there's been a common practice as people have set up committees, budget committee because the money aspects, planning commission from the town, uh, you know, that June document, and then another member from any of the, of the other committees that have expressed an interest. So just left that open. And then three members of the general public. So there's some public participation. So that's the basic, um, but more fleshed out version of what we've been talking about with a scope of work and a timeline associated. I think it's important that we make sure that this committee represents the entire town, that it's got a geographic mix of people, as well as, you know, I know it's, it's fine to say we're going to pick people from other committees, but we don't always have a good geographic mix on those committees because we end up filling them with whoever decided they wanted to step up and do it. Um, but this is something I think that's important. We make sure we have a uh, fair representation on. Yeah. 
we do have that baked into the, the public appointment piece to, to try to get that geographic representation. And then as you think about committee structure, you could further try to balance that out by, by thinking about who's on the committees and, and what makes the, the most sense to try to get that broad perspective um, that, that covers the different, different areas. Sorry. That was in our minutes, wasn't it, from the last month? Uh, the, there was some stuff from last month. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then going back to I think it was August to July, we talked about that piece a little, a little more. I think I was trying to find it in here, and then I realized it was in a minute. It, yeah, yeah. I think it would also be useful if once or twice along the way in those months, if they came back and told us where they were at. So. Yeah, regular reporting. So. Queenie, to your comment, do you have any thoughts about a method for broadening the geographic representation? Obviously, the people who step up are often the same people, no matter what the topic. And I just wonder if, uh, if there's some way we can, not that we would be necessarily recruiting members for the committee, but is there is there some way we can put feelers out to historically underrepresented underrepresented sectors of the town on these kinds of bodies? And I'm not sure that we can't recruit people, right? If we have areas yeah. of the town that are underrepresented, usually it would make sense for us to reach out to people and, yeah. and try yeah. to get them to come forward. Um, you know, I think this committee is, is going to have a fair amount of work to do. Um, so, uh, you know, somebody who's kind of got that savvy and the time and the energy to put into it is going to be important. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that this has the potential um, to either go really well and do some great things for the town or go really south and become a big battle. Can you explain that a little more, Penny? Well, so first off, the money comes to the town of Randolph. And yeah. so it goes to the entire town. And so we're going to get into that town versus village discussion. So if all the members of the committee are from the village and the money all goes to the water wastewater district, for example, then there's there's going to be some pretty upset people. Okay. I see what you're saying. I would say we should maybe finalize this at the next meeting and move forward. If that's soon enough. Yeah. So Trevor, are you looking for us to approve the scope of this committee? So then yeah. it can be made public that we're looking for people. Yeah, yeah, that'd be the action that we're seeking. And the appointments would come after. So if that's the case, I'll move that we approve the scope of the ARPA funding committee, uh, scope of work as, as set forward tonight and, uh, and we're with the appointing committee. 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Yeah. All right. Next up is uh, consider authorizing mailing ballots for town meeting. Requested by the town clerk. It's certainly early in the process, but that's not a bad thing. Um, the question is whether or not we want to mail ballots to everyone for town meeting 2022, similar to what we did um, certainly for the general election in 2020. I think even maybe, for, I don't know if that is what happened here for town meeting 2021, um, but for the general for sure, um, it's possible with select board action, the deadlines to make this decision aren't until much later based on when you actually warn town meeting and have to uh, mail ballots. I think it's 20 days, no less than 20 days before town meeting. So we need to be able to mail ballots by. Um, and certainly 10 or so days at a minimum before that we'll have warned town meeting. So we'd be in a spot um, to be able to do that minus some printing time. Um, there's not an exact cost estimate for this. We've got about um, 3,500 registered voters who would be receiving a ballot based on the uh, reimbursements from when we mailed out last year or for, for the last elections, they were in that $2,500 to $3,000 range. That's about all the postage in the, in the clerk treasurer's budget. But this is one of those things where if you sort of view it as, as a valuable uh, democratic access tool, uh, we can certainly find ways to, to make up the other postage mm -hmm. funds and maybe in some other areas. So. It'll overspend that line, but it's the kind of thing that we could probably figure out um, in, in other places how to, how to more than make that back. Base question is whether or not you want to mail ballots. We're going to do other things in between. Emory's got a plan to install some, some newer, bigger, secure ballot boxes, for example, um, out front uh, for, for Dropbox access. And that protects us a little bit, uh, depends on what happens with the pandemic and what access to the polls. Mm -hmm. Could look like. So how would this work vis-a-vis -vis in person voting that that Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Like if it, it would still be in person vote. Yeah. Or you could drop your ballot off that day that you got in the mail. Right. It would essentially work like a universal absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. So you get the ballot. If you don't return it, you can either bring it back with you as long as you're not checked off, you know, check in at the polls and, and vote same oh, I day. See. Okay. Yeah. So they'll still be open here on. Yeah. Right. But it'll be essentially a drop off event. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you'll get the ballot by mail and you can mail it back or you can still access, come in and access. And is there enough time for built into the process for overseas voters, say military members that are deployed else, you know, deployed elsewhere? That that's remember the, that was a concern yeah. previous times. I just wonder. I want to make sure that everybody's in franchise. So. Yeah. The the pressure points with that will relate to when we warn town meeting. So if we're toward the back end of the deadline, so the end of January, we've narrowed the window. You've got a not less than and not more than. So if we're on the front end of that, there's another 15 or so days um, to process everything and mail it out. If you're on the back end. Of January, still within your statutory time frame, but now you're about a month out from town meeting. I get the ballots together, get that list, and then you're relying on on postal services to get the ballot to the service member uh, and then get it back. So there's still it still can be a tight timeline, but your minimum window, um, and I figure you got 20 to 25 days, say, depending on when the ballot, you know, when the um, town meeting is warned. And those ballots can be printed how we print them if it's an in-house thing that's one thing if it has to go out and it takes a couple of days that can cut in so some of those pieces are just more logistical um, this in and of itself makes sure everybody gets that mail just service members or people in town or or anyone in between we know how many were sent out last time and how many were returned uh, that i don't know but i can I can run that now. Yeah, I, 
question would be, I think the first time around, we sent out the cards reminding people they could vote absentee, but we didn't send it to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that, that would be a less expensive way to do it, and we wouldn't have all those extra ballots. Yeah. yeah, that would be another option too. Does Marie have a preference? But I have to pull them on between the postcard option and that we only had talked about the mailing. He wanted everybody to like the idea of more people getting the ballot. Yeah, I think that the ultimate goal is to, to try to broaden participation to the extent possible. And, and the mail in balloting did seem to do that, um, at least for the 2020 jump. Granted, there are some other factors that may have driven right. turnout up. In that particular moment, but so remind me if I'm um, didn't we go to the postcard because Joyce said it got really challenging with all the different ballots with the police district, the water district, the sewer district to mail to everybody. And if they only had to do those that the postcard came in, they were doing a certain number of a, di a day that got requested. It's possible that that kind of predates me. So sounds right. Yeah, that, that sounds like that's my recollection. Yeah. It's complicated. So Trevor, you want to go back and in, uh, in chat with Emery and see what he thinks on yeah. that? Yep. Yeah, we got a few things to run down, I think. Okay. All right. Consider approving the Village Fire Department facility use policy. So I don't know if anybody, uh, hopefully, everybody had a chance to read this, but. Uh, I'm having a hard time with the town paying all the fees for that building and any use where it's paid for goes into a fund for the firemen. Um, and, and them determining who, who to use it. That's a, that's a town facility. And it should, I believe it should follow the same use policy as our other buildings but be coordinated with what they have going on. You know, the, the taxpayers pay for the building, we pay for the utilities, we pay for the cleaning crew, um, all that. It's, um, you know, it's the town's building, not just the fireman's building. There are organizations using it already. Of course, uh, the Sunrise Rotary Club meets in there every week. I don't mm -hmm. know what. I don't know what, and I don't know whether they're paying any fee or not at this point. I don't believe so. I just wonder what the what the impetus for this. Was and I agree with you. It is a it is a fully town funded facility. Well, I think the use of it should be the same as when somebody wants to use a conference room at the town hall. You know, they call yeah. up and say, "Hey, is is the conference room available on Tuesday at two o'clock?" You know, they could call up and say, "Hey, it's a conference room." at the fire station available on whatever day for this use. Does it say in this proposal, Trini, that the money would go into a fund for the firemen? I didn't see that in here. 
Um, in number, number five on page one, it sets up that there's a donation right. to the fire department, which would donations generally go as opposed to a user fee that was paid to the town. I don't know if that's the part you're pulling from Trini, but that was the one I put my eye on. Yep, that's it. And then conversations with Mike Hildebrand, it is to go into their fund. Um, but I also believe if we want to have everything open, accessible, available to everyone, then we have one policy. Everybody follows it. There's one you know, place where they go to try to find space they can use. Uh, I don't know that we want to get into, well, the fire department didn't let us use it because they don't like our organization. You know, I think it's opening us up to, to a different process that brings with it some risk. I think you're training, you're making a bunch of really good points. And, um, and I think in addition, the, you know, it says here that the fire chief can, at, as, at his discretion, may waive the donation requirement. And that sounds like it could be problematic in exactly that kind of way as well. I like the idea of it being the same as, as other build town buildings. I think that makes a lot of sense. You shouldn't ever have to waive a donation because it shouldn't be mandatory if it's a donation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the idea behind the donation, right? Oh, no, we don't So I just want to jump in here for a second. Sorry for the road noise, but you also have a building in East Randolph, you know, two buildings down there that you'd have to take into consideration. I believe Randolph Center wouldn't fall into this because I think they own their own building. Uh, but you know, you've got two other facilities, and I think there should be a blanket policy across the board that addresses all of them. Yeah, there's no space in the fire station in East Randolph, um, but I would assume once the hall gets renovated and can have use in it, it should definitely be right there, the same as the others. Yeah. A little bit of a, a, a curveball, and I don't know how this. But how does Chandler fit in to this as well? Because they will, on occasion, and I'm not talking about renting out the music hall for another presenter, to, but they'll occasionally rent out the community room on the second floor. To we have a lease agreement with Chandler. Chandler Chandler's an entity that's, that's leasing the space from the town, technically. Right, so they can control in that I think they have full control of what they do with that building because we've given them the, the, the lease on the building to right. use as they okay. see fit so I don't think that really applies here I think what applies here are the two fire stations and the East Randolph Community Hall and, yeah. and also buildings you know like the town hall so you know I think that um, you know not to say that it doesn't happen you know sometimes I believe all these fire stations you know they pull the trucks out and they're sitting in front and they're having a you know baked bean supper or something or so those are the kind of things that I think we need to figure out what the if it's going to be somebody else other than the fire department then I think we need a policy for that yeah and it should be consistent across the venues yeah that's, that's what I'm yeah that's what I believe it should be a consistent policy yeah that makes sense I had, I had two questions that to throw into the discussion. At the village fire station, can they lock the rest of the building off? Yes, they can. Anything that we didn't want the public to be into, they could just lock that off. So that's not an issue. Yep, the office and is all locked and the access to the garage part locks too. Yeah. We talked about an administrative room, maybe. Is that the office? That, that's at the far end of the... That's, we've right done some, that's when we've done some interviews in, in the past. That's so not the administrative office, right? That's the well, no, that's the, that's, that's the meeting room. The administrative office is right there when you come in. It's... Um, 
it they don't use it for the fire department. I believe it's wide open. It's open right now. Is that something that can be locked off or doesn't need to be? I think it's empty, Pat. So at this point, it doesn't matter. I would imagine if they ever needed it um, for a, you know, a town activity, it could be locked. Yeah, it's an extra room right now. Okay. And my other question was, park, was parking, say there was a meeting there and there was a fire? They have plans where they would park if the parking lot was full? Nope. Probably be like it used to be. They'd be all over everybody in the neighborhood. There's not enough parking there to have the fire department respond and have a large meeting at the same time. Yeah. So there ought to be some backup plan of neighbors letting them park somewhere or something temporarily. Seems like. Trevor's writing that down so that suits my needs. <laughs> Scribbling furiously. Yeah. Do we have policies related to the other two buildings in East Randall? Or are those so there is a there's no space in the uh, fire station. There could be, I guess, okay. if they pulled the trucks out. Um, right. But in the hall right now is shut down. Right. Right. So. Until it gets rehabbed. And I would assume that once that's rehabbed and going to be open for use, we would want to add that to whatever policy we create. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds sounds like this needs to be tabled or or uh, tuned up a bit. We've got a facility usage policy that I think is mostly designed for here that we can then start to build that common template, you know, blanket yeah. policy yeah. from, and develop that out out from there. I think that's where the we're just. Looking at it, the twenty-five dollar number comes yeah. from that other policy. I think is, is where that came from, at least. But uh, it sounds like a desire for a blanket. If the town owns a facility, there's a blanket policy that that governs the use. Mm -hmm. And there might be some individual pieces that go with it, such as what happens in the event that there's a fire in an event at the same time, the village fire department, or, or if, if there has to be some sort of nuance based on the space itself. Mm -hmm. but, but by and large, everything would be consistent throughout. Am I correct in thinking that that policy has a usage fee, but that isn't being charged now? Yeah, we haven't. It's been charged sporadically, if at all. Um, But we also have a policy for our recreation facilities. Yeah. We may want to see if that element of that can be. Yeah, we're going to, have to see how these things all stitch together, I think, to, to try to make one unified, consistent uh, guiding set of documents or document. Trini. Is there was there a specific issue or set of issues that motivated the creation of this proposed Randolph Village fire station policy? If there was, they didn't share it. Um, I got it uh, maybe a week or so ago from Mike Hildebrand and just said, hey, what do you think of this? And I told him just what I've said tonight. And he said, I'm not surprised. I'm going to take it to Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like that's going to get him anywhere. <laughs> I took it here, so yeah, you guys can say the same thing here. Right? <laughs> punt, it, punt it right back. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what the uh, 
I don't know what the impetus was for it. If this is their way to be able to charge a fee maybe, or um, not sure. Okay, yeah. I'm just curious about, you know, why, why, why these particular you know, sets of, of initiatives and, and, why, and why now? And, and, if, and if we know more about that, it might, might give us other you know, sort of food for thought for things to include in a revised town life policy. Um, agreed. All right. Well, we'll look for that. Uh, next up is uh, proving water and wastewater allocations. We have a quartet before you. There's an increase in wastewater allocation at New England Precision. There is a request for wastewater allocation at 142 East Bethel Road for La Lumia. There's a water and wastewater allocation request for a parcel of zero Pearl Street. And the final one is the 22 Water Street, Terra Maori. This is a wastewater allocation. And three of them look like they're for um, house with an apartment in the Zero Pearl Street context. Two others are, I think, single, single family uses. And then obviously, New England Precision will be a commercial customer. Anybody have any questions on these? I have some questions. Um, let me start with the first one. Sure. Um, this is the same building that we recently increased, right? A year or so ago. New England Precision, what is that what we're talking about? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, they did have an increase fairly recently. This would this is an additional increase. It's just good to know they're doing that. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like they're super busy. My second question was, um, what's the water used for there? Is there any problem for the sewer plant? Um, Chris Chambers says that our Sewer plant has plenty of capacity for this. Problem um, in terms of what's in the water, though, once it's discharged. Um, well, I th I think this particular wastewater allocation is 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 not a, any kind of a special case. In the past, when we've had um, agreements with New England Precision, um, they were much more complicated because of the sorts of things that they were discharging. But this is um, not like that. Why is that? Um, I don't, you know, I don't remember the details of of it, but, it, but as part of the their process, this was wastewater that is not like when when they got an increase in allocation last year, um, they were specifically moving to from, from, from different systems, and we were going to be seeing certain um, um, I don't know what the word is. Um, contaminants in, in their wastewater that was not what you would expect like from a residence or things like that. And that we need, we need to be careful with how that gets treated. Um, but this was, I guess, coming from a different part of their production line. And and Chris says that it, it we can just treat it like a normal wastewater allocation request. That's what I was wondering. That's why he said probably under recommendation, but discharge agreement parameters don't change. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And the second one, what do we want to do? Oh. Last one, Mallory first. Are all the places up to the center metered? The district meter everything there. Up, up in the little Randolph Center water fire district. Yeah. Um, 
Is that just separately management managed system? I, I don't know. I, I don't believe so, but we can check that out. We've been talking with them generally. So that one and the room is would have to be needed. The water would have to be needed. So they'd have to be some way, yeah. We could read it. So yeah. Have to use it to read it, read it. <coughs> precision installing a carbon filter system and improving the quality. What's the other note Chris sent? Just now. And I had the same question on the linears. Was that needed? Is that right side by side? You know, Pat, I, 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 we had this conversation on the wastewater committee when we talked about this, and I wish I could remember the details better. Um, but I, but I know it's it. They will. They, it is metered, but I believe it's metered. You know, the same way that. Sewer is metered for regular residences where it's basically tied to your water usage. And there's some way that they do that in Randolph Center, which is different um, because it's a separate water system. So I, I but I, I forget how, I just forget how, how, that, how that works, whether we get copies of the, the, the meter, the water meter readings up there and we base our sewer off of that, but we but we we don't take those meter readings ourselves in in the in the town water district. I know with VTC they do their own readings. Mm -hmm. We will need to put meters in for both of those. So be putting in the property owner's expense and just to clarify if it's a water and wastewater thing too. But we want to be there that we can announce on it. Just wastewater near the college, yeah. So it'll just be a wastewater. Water meter. Yeah, the note says just wastewater. They're getting they're just getting wastewater, but we won't charge them based on the water rates. So right. Everybody else would. I would think. My understanding of the past would require everybody to meet it in one. And then the question on the last one I had the lot at the end of Pearl Street it says run gardens. Mm -hmm. Are they actually going to be doing some gardening there? <laughs> it's stuck out there. I'm, saying, I'm thinking that if they're going to use anything for irrigation. Something that uh, I think it's just a house with an apartment. They may decide to grow some tomatoes or the or poppies or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Makes it sound uh, aesthetically pleasing. It's a pretty big block. Yeah. So yeah, the water would be metered, even though it's a separate system for the wastewater purposes. Um, nobody else has questions. I'll move we approve those four applications with the um, making sure that they have water meters. Okay. On which the uh, wastewater usage is based. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up is an assembly permit for the town tree lighting. It's an annual event at the application with packets. And this would be for December 3rd. There was some conversation about a parade on the, I think it would be the week after as well, but this covers the, the annual tree lighting. It would be the closure of a portion of, of Pleasant Street, so between um, Main and Prince. 
basically the same spots. So by the gear house and the town gazebo to be set for Friday, December 3rd. There's a snow inclement weather date listed here of Sunday, December 5th. So this would be at 5 to 7 p.m. Could start at 3. Be different hot cocoa and coffee, be speech for sale, speakers with holiday music. So it sounds like it should be familiar to anybody who's in the past, if I understand. And the fire show, I forget exactly what they're called, but at one point, it looked like they were going to perform on Halloween. I believe it's going to perform at this instead, if I understood that part. So that's a surf de fuego. The so circus of been, fire, right? And there's a banner placement permission form with it. So that would be up to advertise the event as well. I'll move we approve the uh, assembly permit application and banner placement permission for the Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is grants. For the first time since I've been here, there is no new grant requests. It feels a little awkward, I guess. <laughs> um, at some point, though, we'll have to go back and revisit um, the conversation related to the library's grant. And so maybe on the, the agenda for the 16th, this was to get the $20,000 grant for his, from Historic Preservation. If they get that, the, the Board of Trustees Library wanted to match with another $40,000, which left $140,000 to cover the $200,000 cost. Um, and it's anticipated in, in the capital plan and in the budget for fiscal 22 as a facility reserve expenditure. Nothing to do tonight. I just wanted to keep that in your brains um, as something that we'll still have to determine at some point. Okay, old business. Hearing nothing, other business. Manager's report. Nothing new to add from there except for um, 5.30 p.m. next Thursday for that joint work session with the Energy Committee. And I heard today that the auditors are working on a draft of the fiscal 21 audit. So that should hopefully conclude sooner than later. Nice. Uh, executive session. Any prospects for open positions? Uh, not, not yet. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we got Hello. somebody on the phone. Yeah. Hey, this, this, I've, I've been listening, and this is Milo. Oh, hi, Milo. Yeah, we, are, we appointed you early on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> about two minutes after 5 30 so maybe i missed you okay so i've been appointed yes okay yep. very good Thank you. congratulations Myla. <laughs> <laughs> i think <laughs> all right uh so next up we have executive session stop it just after they do the motions oh that's right sorry what are we talking about uh, yeah, two quick contract check-ins and then the personal and legal piece are essentially the, the same matter. Uh, had elements of both. And... Entertain a motion to go into executive session. I'll move we go into executive session for those purposes. I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries.